So hi, everybody. Uh, with me today is Cole Wakefield. Cole is the executive director of the Good Shepherd Humane Society, and he is going to share with us a little bit about his vet of record relationship and what makes it successful. So thanks, Cole, for chatting with me today. Um, tell us a little bit about your community and your organization. Sure. Um, Good Shepherd Humane Society is a small rural humane society. Uh, we serve primarily Carroll County in Northwest Arkansas, uh, which is a county of about 25,000 people. Um, we have a couple of small cities. And when I say small cities, I mean like in, in the thousands, you know, 2,000, 3,000. And, um, and that's what we do. So we're, we're a proud rural humane society who has worked hard to um, leverage the resources we have to, to really serve our community in as in many ways as possible. So how many animals do you serve a year? Um, in the shelter, we, uh, we see about 600 dogs and cats come through every year. Um, and we have, uh, we have 20 dog kennels and we have two cat rooms. So, um, you know, rough capacity of the shelter is, is about 60 animals. Um, and then we, so we turn it over around 10 times a year. And how many veterinarians would you say you have in your community? Um, you know, in the community, there, there are, there are some private, private veterinarians, um, and, uh, Carroll County is probably a little bit lucky, uh, as far as the number of veterinarians it has for a rural community. Um, but, but not near as many veterinary options as you would find in, in a lot of, uh, more concentrated places. So for the purpose of this conversation, we're talking about the veterinarian of record relationship. And you, I know that you have a veterinarian of record relationship that is successful. So we really wanted to hear from you, um, you know, what does that look like? What makes it successful? And then we can continue to dialogue there. Um, I, I'm assuming you don't have your own staff veterinarian. No, we don't have our own staff veterinarian. Uh, we have, you know, we do have veterinarian record on contract. Um, and uh, he, you know, his role here is that uh, he, he basically signs off on the protocols that our staff uses. Um, you know, so we know that 90% of the, or probably more than that, of the issues that we're going to encounter in the shelter are going to be in the same set, the same ones that we're going to encounter. So for those, we, uh, we have used uh, protocols. Um, and uh, then he also, of course, were able to order medicines uh, because of that, that are on the protocol, uh, which can save us a lot of money. And, um, you know, it's been great, but I think the key to it, and I think this is the key to, to, I guess, every relationship, but especially one like this that does involve sort of regulatory issues and licensing issues and 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 things of real consequence. It's it's trust, um, and so we have we have worked hard to to build the trust in both directions, in that um, you know he trusts us not to to abuse the privileges that come with his license, so that would cause him a lot of trouble and his ability to continue to make a living. And then we trust him to be responsive to our needs and to understand shelter medicine and, and to be willing to, to work with us to figure out how things have worked. And, and so there's a, um, you know, a, a lot of open dialogue and back and forth. And, um, but that has proven to be, be successful for us. So I want to um, unpack trust a little bit more, but before we do that, how did you find this veterinarian and how did you successfully get him to want to work with you? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, the, I was a little bit of an advantage there. Um, the, I actually had known him from working at a previous humane society. Um, this was a humane society that, that was a very large one um, that had gone through, was going through a financial crisis and actually was, was at its, in its last days. And it was, um, a really kind of crazy time to be working at that place. And he was there and I was the clinic manager there. So we had built a working relationship in the time in a time of crisis. So we may have had some trauma bonding, um, you know, that, that helped us with, with that relationship. So when I, when I came up to, to this facility, um, and I needed a, a vet of record and knowing that he wasn't in town, I mean, he's, he is two hours away. I did call him and say, Hey, would you be interested in trying to figure out how we can make this work? Cause I need, you know, I, I need a, you know, I need to be able to order medicines. We need to be able to work on protocols. Um, you know, we can't, we can't afford to 
uh, be traveling to a private vet, even if we can find appointments um, for all of these things. So you already had built the relationship. So relationship building, you had that previously. And because of that, he was willing to come to your new organization. Right. And, and, and so that certainly helped. And I mean, I want to acknowledge that that, you know, maybe it gave me a little bit of a head start um, than than what a, a traditional thing would do. But um, but that's because we had built, you know, that trust working together. If he didn't trust me, it wasn't just that we knew each other, but if he didn't trust what we were doing and believe in the work, you know, he could have very well have said no. But but I think that that is why um you know, if if he moves out of state or something goes on and we have to start over from scratch with somebody else, you know, that I, I know that, um, you know, we may need to do things to help facilitate that trust and be willing to to um, work with them. Um, and, I, and I think a lot of vets want to do this sort of thing. And I think it helps them feel good. I think it helps them feel like they're doing something important. And and if, you know, like uh, um, our guy makes a little bit of extra money on the contract. Um, but, if, you know, if we even with the trust, you know, we have guardrails in place. And and I think that's that's the key um, is putting those guardrails in place. And we have the protocol that my staff is is taught. These are the protocols and these are what you this is how you do it. You're not a veterinarian. I don't care how long you've worked at the, at the shelter. You're not a veterinarian. We operate on these protocols. If you don't think they're right or you have a question, you have to call and talk to him and and, and we reinforce that. And of course, sometimes, you know, you have to go back out and go, no, everybody, remember, we operate on on these protocols. Um, and if we weren't being consistent um, and there were issues, then I don't think that that relationship would have maintained over, I think, we're probably on five years of working with him as a better record. So how did you start this um, this conversation with him? So he agreed to come in. Did you do you have any kind of written um, agreement with him? How did you determine on pricing? Uh, a lot of times people, for example, think the veterinarians need to come in and do it for free. And that's just not realistic or fair either. So how did you set yeah. the expectations so he knew exactly what uh, he was getting and what you needed from him and that you were getting your needs met? Yeah, I mean, I think we, and of course, this was five years ago. I mean, I think I, I looked at that. one. No, you. It's important to pay people. I mean, uh, you know, veterinarians are professional um, who have gone to school and uh, invested a lot of money into their own career, um, and no more than we should work for free. I don't work for free. Um, they pay me to sit here and be executive director, um, and so I don't think it's unreasonable to expect the same from a veterinarian, um, and. Yeah, I mean, I think we've looked, you know, it was just kind of really just looking at budgets and 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 kind of guessing what was fair. And, you know, we we talked and came up with a number that that worked for the amount of commitment, which is, you know, relatively small as far as time. A visit every other week and then just kind of on call. Um and you know, and it and it worked. And we wanted it, it it became just kind of collaborative, something that was comfortable for us. It didn't strain, didn't strain our budget. And and with the understanding that by paying him we're saving a substantial amount of money. So, you know, we could be paying him or we could be paying every other vet in the county for private appointments and then paying full price for medicine and all that. So so even with what we pay him, which isn't, you know, it isn't unsubstantial, um, it's still a significant savings over what it would cost for us otherwise. And then really what I did, you know, he, he had worked some in the shelter with me in Fort Smith. So he had a little bit of an understanding of shelter medicine and kind of you know, he, he got what we we're trying to do because it is a little bit different of, of a medicine, but um, I pretty much went to um, Austin Pets Alive and they put all their protocols, shelter medicine protocols online and um, copied them all off. And I handed them to him and I said, here you go, you know, make whatever changes you want, you know, based upon what you feel is the appropriate treatment that, that, that you believe in. And that is what we'll run with. And, and that's what we did. And he did make some, you know, make some changes and, um, and that's, you know, and I, you know, enter the changes in, put them in our protocol book and that's what we operate off of. So can you tell me about a time where something like broke there and how you dealt with that conflict? Yeah. You know, well, and there are also, you know, there's all sorts of things that pop up and that is, you know, maybe a medicine that's on the protocols is uh, backordered. Or um, we're not seeing a, a response or, or, we're, or we're doing something. We just don't feel like it's working right. 
Um, and, and I think that's where the key of, of communication comes in and that, um, you know, it's not just me, you know, my shelter manager has a direct line to the vet. And um, he, and I think that, and that is, that is a, an important part on his end of the relationship and that he is open to this conversation. He's not a, you know, my way or the highway, or, you know, I'm not going to answer your phone call, just run the protocol. If we have concerns, he'll, he'll listen to us, um, make those adjustments uh, if necessary, or, or explain, you know, no, you know, I, this is why I practice medicine this way. And this is my thing. And, and at the end of the day, he's our veterinarian and that relationship is important. And even if there is, um, you know, even if I'm not a hundred percent with like, oh, that's what I would do. Um, you know, it's his call. And, um, and that's, you know, and that's where, where we lean to. So you said a minute ago that he comes in every other week. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with uh, emergencies or any needs that you have in between? And uh, is that a, a contract that you have with another relationship or another veterinarian in the yeah, community? So we don't, I mean, we just, um, you know, we use the, we utilize local vets for emergent cases. Um, we actually try, there's a couple in our, you know, there's three or four veterinarians in the county as a whole. Um, we we do our best to kind of spread around, you know, just for relationship building and to to use, you know, mul you know, ones. Uh, and, but sometimes it's just a matter of calling and saying, oh, hey, who has who has an appointment? Who has, who can do a walk in or a work in? Um, but we definitely do, um, you know, utilize local vets for those emergent cases that that we're not equipped to handle uh, and that can't be handled, you know, through a consultation with with our contract vet. Um, but it is, I think, important that, you know, we 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 fill him in too. you know, at, when he comes in, if there's an animal, hey, this guy went or our. You know, and sometimes it's him, you know, we'll send him something and he'll go, you should probably get that dog to a local vet as soon as you can. And we'll go, oh, okay. Um, so with your local vets, is that a contracted rate that you're paying them or are they charging you full price? Um, they all offer us some sort of, there's no contract. They all offer us, um, you know, a frequent customer or a nonprofit discount. So we do get a little bit of a discount. Um, and several of them, you know, will occasionally, you know, throw us free services and, and stuff. Uh, and, and that has come through, um, it wasn't always like that, but I think it's come through because we've started trying to work with them more collaboratively. Um, and, and that we, that we also are more understanding of, of their requirements, um, you know, and, and, and communicate with them. And that's just, and, and by using more than one, we, we've been able to really build relationships, um, and, you know, I think it's really helped us out. Yeah. So it sounds like, again, relationship building across the board. It sounds like setting the expectations and the tone, having the standard uh, policies and procedures that everybody follows, making sure that you hold your staff accountable for those. And paying your bill. And I mean, I, I, mean yeah. I, I think that that is the one of the reasons. Um, that we struggled, I think, at first with even the, the local vets um, were, you know, there were times in the past where, you know, bills would pile up and not get paid. And and whether, you know, if it is a, if it's a locally owned practice, well, that's somebody's paycheck that, that they're waiting on. Um, and if it's a privately owned or private equity practice, then they have their bosses breathing down their neck going, you know, why do you have these open accounts? And so, um <laughs> One of the things that we try really hard is to make sure that that our bills are are paid and that that we are we are good customers and good clients um, and that you know inspires them to be good you know partners with us. Have you heard from your veterinary partners what it's what's in it for them? Yeah, I mean, I you know it's and I think that we've all had that experience probably in animal welfare where there can sometimes be a little bit of tension. Uh, between animal welfare agencies like ours and, and private veterinarians. Uh, and I think, you know, some of it comes from, there's a certain expectation. Oh, you should give us, you know, we're the charity. You should work for free or cheap. Um, and 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 the vets sometimes get frustrated. Well, you probably should have brought this dog here three weeks ago instead of trying to do whatever random, you know, shelter thing that you were trying to invent. Um, but, you know, since we since we started really having a lot of communication and being open and, you know, and sometimes like um, I got 
you know, a donation of a whole bunch of uh, rear, like, like probably 50 or 60 rear harnesses, right, for dogs that are generally, that are paralyzed. No way I, I could ever, would ever be able to, like those things would just sit for, for 10 years in our, in our warehouse here, our storage room here. So I took them to, to our local vets and said, hey, you know, if you have clients that can't afford stuff or need these, you know, here you go use them. So you know, even things like that, that, you know, that has built that relationship and, and, and you can tell that, that they do get pleasure of, of knowing that they're, that they're, when we're not adversarial with each other, I think we can both sides get to see the benefits of working together. Um, and I certainly get that feeling from, from all of our vets now in the county. And you're looking at, it sounds like you're looking at it as a partnership, not just a contractual relationship. Yeah, 100%. And um, and I think, and I try to keep it open both, both directions where, you know, if, if there's something I need or I need help, um, I can call them. Um, and then they also know that they can call us. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, they may have a, an animal that was abandoned at their, at their practice or somebody who's struggling and may need a little help. And we, you know, and if we have some compassionate care money, um, but we really, you know, try to keep those lines open every um, every veterinary office in this county has my personal cell phone and they know that they can call me um, and that, you know, my philosophy is that we are all partners in the health and safety of our community. And does your contract veterinarian feel comfortable with your communication with the other veterinarians as well? Because, we, you know, we have heard that sometimes when there's multiple veterinarians working within an organization that there's sometimes conflict there. And based so, on drug use or anesthesia protocol or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, and, and there was a little bit of, so, and, and there has been, in, in you know, as we've gone through this, we have had issue, mainly just confusion about, you know, maybe one vet was thinking this was going to happen, but then it kind of went this direction or, or, you know, something got missed. Um, and so what we do, I mean, we just, you know, it's in the history of the dog. And when we're talking to one vet about an animal, if another vet has been involved in the treatment or anything, we say, hey, you know, we've been working with this doctor. This is what they have done. This is what they've said, um, you know, but ultimately um, and generally for us, you know, whatever vet is holding the animal and looking at the animal at that time, you know, if they're like, this is, they're directing the care, um, you know, especially in the emergent cases, uh, even if it is different than maybe what our normal vet would do, he understands too that in an emergent case, it's the vet that's there taking care of the animal. Um, that's going to be the one who's going to direct that care. Um, and, you know, now upon discharge, the animal comes back um, and, you know, there's a treatment plan or something, um, you know, our vet may make those adjustments, um, you know, and that is, that is perfectly fine. But uh, again, those are things I think communication and openness is, is, is the key. I found that, that most vets are okay. They're okay with somebody maybe making a different decision they're just not okay with being surprised about it. Got it. That's about communication. Well, I don't want to end our conversation without talking about uh, record keeping and that and communication. How yeah. since your vet is not coming, um, you know, every day, how do you keep your records so that your veterinarian could be efficient when they do come? and have the information that they need? Are you doing it all on the phone? Do you have a database? Like, how are you keeping yeah, track so, of that? And, and that was honestly something that was a little bit of a, of a learning curve because, you know, um, you know, the vet would come and go and then we realized, oh, wait a second, there was this dog with that hurt leg that we really want to make sure they got looked at. But, you know, in the, in the chaos of whatever, it didn't happen. So, you know, we really started leaning on our shelter management software. We use Shelter Love to, you know, if to put in a vet request to, to schedule those things in the system that can be easily sort of looked up when the vet comes, okay, who do we have waiting on the vet and making sure that we're documenting any concerns um, in the system and not just in our head or writing it down somewhere on a piece of paper. Um, and that's the key. And, and I think and it's one of those things that there may not be a, a silver bullet on that type of process that works everywhere, but you have to figure out what's going to work best in your facility based upon your volume um, and the resources available. But you have to have something um, because I think, that, you know, you don't want to waste your pet's time. I mean, your vet's time. You don't want to waste their time with standing around like, what am I need to do? 
Um, but you also don't want to be in such a hurry and just trying to push them through that you end up missing animals that need to be examined. So yeah. having that stuff written down and scheduled um, is key. And having multiple people who can access that information and know it in case in case the one, you know, if you only have one medical person and they're the only one who can access that list and the vet shows up on a day that they're sick, I mean, you know, you're stuck. So um, making sure everybody knows it, knows how it's important and, you know, and all of that documentation. So you get, you know, whether you're giving meds, recording that, um, having a solid shelter management software, I mean, whether you are large or small, where you can record all of this information is just, it's a game changer. Um, and, uh, I think it really helps facilitate this sort of relationship. Yeah. So Cole, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you think has been helpful for be making sure that your vet of record relationship is successful and maintains um, successfully? No, I, I mean, I, I think we've covered a good bit of it. Uh, the number one thing is going back to trust. And I think it's really, really important that the staffs at animal shelters understand how serious and important protocols and following protocols are we all you know we do any of us do this long enough and we all see yeah sure I can look at poop and tell you what kind of worm it is without looking at a microscope whatever you know we all think we get um really smart and 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 it can be really really tempting to go oh I don't need to follow the URI protocol I'm going to skip the stage two or whatever and and it's important that our staff understand how important it is not to do that that, that you need to follow your protocols. If you're going to um, divert from protocols, you need to talk to the vet because that's the only person who can legally divert you from protocols. So, um, and then and then your leadership needs to needs to model how important that is um, because you know if this, especially early on if you're building that relationship with that with a vet, all it's going to take is for for one animal to get something weird done to them. Or for them to get a call from one of their partners going, hey, somebody adopted a dog from your shelter and I saw that they were on this random medicine that makes absolutely no sense. What's going on over there? If that happens, then your veteran relationship is, is in real trouble. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time today and for chatting with me about uh, the vet of record relationship. It sounds like you have a terrific one. If anybody has any questions, are you willing to answer it? And if so, can you give us your email? Yes, um, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, it, my email is Cole W, C O L E W, at Good Shepherd Humane. That's S H E P H E R D Humane dot O R G. Um, and, and and I think that there's a, there's so much benefit that come from from these sort of relationships to both ends of this. Um, and, you know, finding ways that we can make it make it work uh, is is vital, especially for lower resourced areas or areas in, in, in rural areas. Um, and, you know, I'm excited that it's, that it's worked for us. Um, but I think with, with, with the right guardrails and right processes in place that you'll find that there's a lot of veterinarians out there that are willing to do what they, what needs to be done, as long as they feel like it's being done responsibly and in a way that's not going to, going to, um, put their livelihood at risk. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good place to end. So I thank you again. Um, and I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>